Father, we just thank you, Lord, for all that you do for us. Thank you for this time together as brothers and sisters under your banner of holiness and precious righteousness. And Father God, I ask that uh, your Ruach HaKadosh would be upon Kenny. And give him the words to say that would uh, touch our hearts and open our minds to your truth. We thank you for the time that you spent to prepare for this lesson. And bless all of us in Yeshua's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, now the lesson today basically is going to combine pictograms, yeah, Angamatria, and Yeshua's name. And we're going to take a look at this and we'll see how it all fits together. And, and it's really amazing because Yeshua's name really tells us all about who he is, right? Salvation, yes. All about salvation, right? I mean, people have seen his different spellings of it too. But we'll start out the letter Yud, okay, in Yeshua's name is a hand and an arm. That's the pictogram of Yeshua's name. And the hand and an arm refers to work. And each one of us works, and what are we supposed to work? What kind of work are we supposed to do, Rick? Well, it depends. So depends. we're supposed to work works of righteousness in Yeshua, right? No. Well, in Colossians chapter 1 and verse 16, well, the start of verse 15, it says, And he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, for by him all things were created, both in the heavens and on the earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created by him and for him, and he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he himself might come to have first place in everything. What passage is that? That's uh, first. That's Colossians 1, 16 through about verse 19. Okay, it says, It was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in him. So that shows us that everything was in Yeshua. If we look at Colossians chapter 2 and verse 9, it tells us, For in him all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. So here it's showing us that Yeshua, a lot of people don't think about that, but Yeshua is the one that created everything. He's the one that created everything. He made everything. And we could take that back to the beginning. Who was the creator when we talk about the six days of creation and who rested on the seventh day? It tells us right there in Colossians, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. He said what? What did Yeshua say? He said he works the works of him who sent him, right? Now... So in hearing Yeshua's name, the letter Yud is the first letter of the word Yeshua. The second letter is the letter Shin, and it forms two teeth or two tablets. And the two tablets represent the ten words of the Ten Commandments. It also represents to the Jewish people, the Orthodox Jewish people, they use the symbol of the Shin to represent God. So we would know the Shin as God the Father, right? Right. So here you have Yeshua, you have the Father, and you have the Vav, which is the number six, which represents man because man was created on the sixth day. And so we see here in Yeshua's name you have the Father and the Son, and it tells us that he was a man. Okay, if you take a look in John 
Okay? Who has a Bible with me? John 15.10 tells us, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you that my love may be in you and that your joy may be full. Right? So you'd be full of joy. That's what Rabbi just talked about this morning was being full of joy, right? And so what did Yeshua do? Everything the Father commanded him to do, right? And it shows us in Isaiah 59, 6, it talks about the man. Okay, it helps if I could hand out these verses. Oh, I can read verses. Okay, now Isaiah, Isaiah 59, 6. 59, 6. Wait a minute. I got something wrong here. 16, I mean. Isaiah 59, 16. Go ahead and read that. He saw that there was no man and wondered that there was no intercessor. Therefore, his own arm brought salvation for him, and his own righteousness is sustained him. Okay. And in verse 17, the one and put on righteousness like a breastplate and a helmet of salvation on his head and put on garments of vengeance for clothing and wrapped himself with zeal as a mantle according to the deeds so he will repay. Wrapped to his adversaries, recompense to his enemies. To the coastlands he will make recompense. For they will fear the name of the Lord from the west and his glory from the rising of the sun. He will come like a rushing stream which the wind of the Lord drives. And a redeemer will come to Zion. And to those who turn from transgression in Jacob declares the Lord. Says, as for me, this is my covenant with them, says the Lord. My spirit which is upon you and my words which I have put in your mouth shall not depart from your mouth nor from the mouth of your offspring, nor from the mouth of your offspring's offspring, says the Lord from now and forever. Okay, so these words were in Yeshua's mouth. Who did he give them to? Right? Who did he give his words to? He gave them to us, right? And we're supposed to give them to who? To those to receive that are in darkness. To the offspring, right? And that's supposed to be passed down from generation to generation, forever and ever. Yep. It has it has no limit. So Yeshua was the man that came and he gave his word to us. And the last letter in his name is the letter I am which means to see or to know. It's the letter what? Iron. The letter I mean, iron. I it's a silent mean. letter. Oh, okay. Uh, in Yeshua's name, they use the letter iron. Uh, a lot of, uh, like I said, it's a silent letter. Now, yes. okay. what did, what did, the Lord tell them in Exodus chapter 12 and verse 13. The Lord sees and he knows everything, right? Mm -hmm. Everything we do, everything we say, oh, what, 13? All, all our deeds. Um, you say 12, 13? Yes. The blood will be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see <coughs> the blood, I will pass over you. No destruction plague will touch you when I strike Egypt. Right. So that was when he was leading the children of Israel out of Egypt. Okay, now we each, before we accepted Yeshua as our Savior, we were all in our own personal Egypt, right? Yep. Right, yes. And so the Lord calls us out, and he says when he sees the blood, I'm tying this in with Passover a little bit too, <laughs> when he sees the blood, he passes over us just like he passed over the children of Israel. No plague is going to come near our dwelling. He's going to guard us and protect us and watch over us. So he sees and he knows everything that's going on. There's nothing anybody's going to get away with. And like we said back in Isaiah chapter 59, 
he's going to recompense, everybody is going to be recompensed for exactly what they do, for every deed that they do. The works in the flesh, good or bad, good or bad, whatever they are, they're going to be recompensed. God is a judge, and he's a just judge. And he's going to recompense. Now what happens is to the unbeliever, what happens? He's judged guilty. He has no protection. He's already judged guilty by he's the word. Already judged Just like Satan is already judged. Right. By not receiving Yeshua right. as his Savior. The believer, okay, the believer, Yeshua has given us his blood. We've been cleansed by his blood. And it says we go to a judgment too, but it's the judgment seat of Yeshua. And he judges all the works that we do. Right. He said he has books, right? right? And there's accounts in those books. Mm -hmm. And he said what? That our works are either gold mm -hmm. and silver mm -hmm. and precious stones. Yeah. Or those works are wood, hay, and stubble. So what do you think that's referring to? The works that we do in the flesh, they might be good things, right? We can do good things in the flesh. But they're really wood, hay, and stubble. Flesh we still, our works are still like that of filthy rags. Yeah. But the works, <clears throat> what he's talking about, yeah. the works that are done in the spirit right. through the Ruach, they're the gold and silver and precious stones, and when all of that goes through the fire, the only things that are going to count are the gold and the silver and the precious stones and the works that we did in the spirit. Yeah, and, not, the and not by our hands, that's right. And it's the work that he does through us, right. not the work that we do on our own. Right. There's, there's this song that is really cool. Says all this stuff. Says, yeah. uh, so make me golden. Yeah, make me as gold and silver. He refines us. He says as what? He's going to refine us in the fire. Okay. So are there? You say all these letters. Are there eight letters in the name of Yeshua? No, just four. This is the pictogram. Okay. This pictogram is a hand and an arm. This pictogram is two tablets or teeth. The pictogram of the Vav is a peg. A peg, right. A peg or a nail. Um, okay. And so the first one is the letter and the second one is the pictogram. Pictogram, right. Okay. It's a pictogram. The iron is an eye. Okay. The pictogram of the yeah, Not the all-seeing eye of uh, the Illuminati. I mean, sorry, did I say that? Yeah. I'm, I'll show you. It's an eye. <laughs> now, sit <laughs> Hey, Kenny. Yeah, I don't think they understand that you're talking Hebrew alphabet. Yeah. Well, they know about Hebrew alphabet and they know about pictograms. And actually, the pictograms were the original alphabet before they used these letters. Right. Now, as we go on through this, to take a look at Isaiah 61. Tells us more. Talks about we're, we're talking about how Yeshua has right the whole Godhead bodily and everything is there. In Isaiah 61, it says, "The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the afflicted, sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, proclaim liberty to captives, freedom to the prisoners." To proclaim the favorable year of the Lord, the day of vengeance of our God, of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to grant those who mourn in Zion, giving them a garland instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, a mantle of praise instead of a spirit of fainting, so they will be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. And that shows how the spirit of the Lord was with Yeshua. And Yeshua quotes that in Luke chapter 4, I believe it is. So it was already written and spoken into being so that it was done for it him to begin done. his ministry. 
done. So he was fulfilling the, the prophecy of the yeah, he the was writings. fulfilling what he already spoke. Right. <clears throat> he was reiterated for the new covenant believers to understand. Okay, it's in Luke chapter 4. You can go ahead and read that, bro. I didn't say New Testament. Go ahead and read it. Okay, yeah, Luke 4, 18. 4, 18. Well, actually, you can start in verse uh, yeah. 16. Yeah, okay. Uh, so he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. And he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Okay. And then he closed the book. And then he closed up the book and basically was saying, today this prophecy is fulfilled in your hearing, right? I'm here. And a whole group of the people received what he said, and there was another whole group of people that didn't. Okay. Go to John chapter 8. And verse uh, 39. And this will show us that Yeshua actually existed before he came here physically on earth as Yeshua. And in John chapter 8, we start at verse uh, 39. It says, They answered and said to him, Abraham is our father. This is what the people told Yeshua, right? He said, Abraham is our father. And he said, if you are Abraham's children, do the deeds of Abraham. But as it is, you are seeking to kill me, a man who has told you the truth, which I heard from God. This Abraham did not do. You are doing the deeds of your, your own father. father does. And he goes on and on through this. And there's a scripture where he says, before Abraham was, I am. Now, I don't know if it's in this. Uh... Yeah, it says in verse 58 as we follow down in that chapter. Yeah, it is John chapter 8, verse 58. Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say unto you, before Abraham was born, I am. And now the same as Moses spoken about to them in the time of Exodus, to, so they would know who he, he was sent him and who was right and who he was. He says, "I am," and that's in John chapter eight, from verse thirty-nine on. In John chapter one, can, can I ask a quick question? When it says um, you would do the works of Abraham, how what would you define as the works of Abraham? Okay, the works of Abraham. What kind of works did Abraham do? Think about it for a minute. That's probably the... He was, what, he showed hospitality to everybody. <clears throat> Whenever there was a person in need, he was there to supply the need. When Lot got taken in captivity, Abraham took the 318 men that were born in his house and went and rescued Lot and all the people. Um, and he also gave to Melchizedek what was due to him, gave which, was, to which, is, which was parallel to uh, the giving to Caesar, what is Caesar, same thing. Yeah. He, was, he was a righteous man that right. obeyed the commands that God gave him. He was supposed to do one act of charity a month. And, and when they came, huh? One act of charity a month, and then the visitor that comes... You're supposed to feed them and right. water, not question. Right, and so and so he took care of any visitors that came through, no matter who they were. And those those are works and deeds of righteousness. Okay, he also, like I said, he was obedient to God's command, even to the point where he was willing to sacrifice his son Isaac on the mountain. 
forgot about that one. Huh? Forgot about that one. Yeah. And so we see Abraham as a righteous man, and he was the example. And there's a verse that says he obeyed God's ordinances, commands, and stuff. Yeah. And would you, you know, I think, two from Tephron, did he, before God actually gave them the tablets to write down some of the commandments, do you think he already had given them to people in other ways and spoke to In other them? ways, I believe so, because we can go back all the way to the Garden of Eden. And you had Adam and Eve, and you remember that Adam and Eve sinned. And God came and walked with them in the Garden. And talked with them. And talked with them, right? And after they sinned, they were hiding. And what did the Lord do? They, they tried to cover up with fig leaves, or whatever kind of leaf you want to call it, and the uh, Lord said, no, that isn't going to do it, because without shedding the blood, there's no remission of sin, right? So God came and sacrificed the animal and clothed Adam and Eve in skins. When Cain and Abel went to make their sacrifice, Cain and Abel both knew what kind of sacrifice to make, and One Cain didn't right, right. do it. Cain didn't make a sacrifice right. according to what the rules were. So I believe way, way back, way back in the beginning, it might not be written down like we have in our book right now, but they knew what was right and what was wrong and what they were supposed to do. The oral Torah. The oral Torah. Huh? The oral Torah. Oral Torah, right. if you want to call it that, it goes, I believe that goes all the way back to the garden. Right, right. but that... Uh, and that's, that's, you're right, but that also, in the writings, it shows us in the stories. That's why it's so important to read the Torah, because we've been given the, the ideals behind God's thought and His heart for us, and it just has been repetitive continuously until now. So there's no difference from the shedding of the blood of Yeshua for the remission of sin for us. Now it's different for us because we don't have to continue to do the sacrifices, but it's in us. The blood is in us to pass over. I mean, so you can see from the beginning, it's just a repetitive thing. Right. Now, what we can say is, now God in the Torah gave them the sacrifices where they brought the animals to the priest. The person that made the sacrifice had to kill the animal. The blood was taken by the priest and sprinkled. Now, when a person sinned, they brought their animal to the priest. They had to kill that animal. When that animal was slaughtered, the person that killed that animal had to come with the understanding that the blood of that animal was being shed in place of their own blood. That animal was dying. That animal was sacrificed in their place. Right, sometimes if, it did. Yeah. If they didn't go with that attitude in their heart that this animal is dying in my place and they didn't respect the fact that that animal was dying in their place, that sacrifice was unacceptable to God. Right, because there was times that the priest even anointed that person that brought the sacrifice with the blood on the earlobe, the thumb, and the yeah. foot, the and so, so that they would remember what they had done and everything. And so, <clears throat> you know, you can't just, it's just like today, a lot of times in the church, there's a lot of people that talk about grace all the time. And they say, well, I can go sin today and ask Jesus or Yeshua to forgive me, and I can go sin tomorrow and ask Yeshua to forgive me, and go and sin the next day and ask Yeshua to forgive me. But that's not how it works, because you can go look back in the Torah and in the Tanakh, and if that sacrifice wasn't done with the proper heart, right. it was to no avail. It was to no avail. And, and later on in the Tanakh, God says that your sacrifices are an abomination to me. Who told you to do this? And it says away with all of this stuff because you're not doing it with the right attitude of your heart. You're not repentant. You're not asking for forgiveness. And not only that, but in the Tanakh, if you read about all of those sacrifices, all of those sacrifices were made for unintentional sin. That other was more or less willful sin. Right. 
okay? Those sacrifices in the Tanakh were for unintentional sin. There are no sacrifices for intentional sin. Uh, right. Right, Ron? Yeah. There, there, is, there is no right. sacrifice for intentional sin. <coughs> So that, so that once saved, always saved thing they teach blows it out of the water. Is of, uh, is of no and so, relevance. But and so, now, now, granted, Yeshua came and he died. He shed his blood on the tree of sacrifice for the forgiveness of our sin. And if we sin intentional, we, okay, Yeshua loves us. I mean, that there is grace. He can forgive us. He can. If we can, he can. 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 He can. He can. But there's can. but there's no guarantee that he has to do that. It's not it's not something specified in his word that if you go out and commit intentional right. sin, I have to forgive you. Right. Because Yeshua you see what I'm saying. Right, because Yeshua even said to the prostitute and whoever else, now go, go and sin, and no, sin no more. Go and sin no more. So I'll can't forgive you, but Right, but you, so you can't keep overdoing and doing it. But until, the, like the first time a person becomes a believer in Yeshua, they may have been intentionally sinning for 20 years. Yeah, before well, there's, there's, we, the first well, see, time. That's, that's, that's Yeshua makes that decision. Yeah. Y'all, we, can, we can't decide, y'all, it's not up to us to judge okay. another person. Right. That Yeshua said he's a just judge. It said, he says that, that we're judged based on what we know. God judges us based on what we know. Okay, Brett. Um, Methuselah and uh, Noah preach righteousness. Right. And then as a, um, we'll say, what we say is a supportive um, theory of the, like along with sanctification and edification of Yeshua's work. So Yeshua is a, uh, the cross between right. the, uh, the God and the world. Right. You, you can't jump over the great chasm Without Yeshua making the right, Yeshua is the bridge connection. bridge between everything. So unless Yeshua forgives it, so so the the grace thing or, or open grace is only like a sub point of everything that's required of you. So it's a hollow argument. It's only a fraction of mm -hmm. the truth. It's like a person saying, uh, Jesus did healings, but you, you can't cut out stuff that... Yeah. Okay, so now he says in John chapter 1, and it goes back to the beginning again. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And again in John chapter 1, all things came into being by Him and apart from Him. Nothing came into being that has come into being. So here again it shows us that he was the creator, right? right. It says everything is established by what? The word of how many witnesses? Two, two, two or more. Two, two or more. So you have it in Colossians, you have it in the book of John. There's, there's several other places. And John bears witness of Yeshua and says that he's what? The light. And he says, as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become the children of God, even to those who believe in his name. Okay? And it says that we're what? Who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. So we're born, when we accept Yeshua, we're born of God says that the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. We beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Later on in verse uh, 17, it says, For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth were through Yeshua. Okay, and what did Yeshua do? He followed that whole law that Moses gave. Because that was his father's commandment. Mm -hmm. Said, no man has seen God at any time, the only begotten God who is <coughs> in the bosom of the Father. He, 
and is saying, well, okay, so Yeshua is the physical representation that we have of God, right? So he's everything. And when we went back here to talk about seeing and knowing and how Yeshua knows everything, on, on a large scale, we could go to Revelation chapter 2 and 3, where he speaks to the different churches. And in uh, Revelation chapter 2, he says to the angel of the church in Ephesus, the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand, the one who walks among the seven golden lampstands, I know your deeds. Right? So to the church of Ephesus, he told them, I, and he does the same thing on an individual basis, right? Okay, so the church of Ephesus, I know your deeds. Right. To the church of Smyrna, I know your tribulation and your poverty. Mm -hmm. To Pergamos, I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is. Mm -hmm. has, his, has his throne, right? <laughs> okay. To the angel of the church of Thyatira, I know your deeds and your love and your faith and service and perseverance. Uh, the church in Sardis. I know your deeds, that you have a name, that you are alive, but you are dead. So he sees and he knows it all. Now, when we look at the Gematria a little bit, Yeshua's name adds up to 386. And we already know, we showed in the Word that Yeshua is what all of God had bodily, right? Mm -hmm. so, so three is the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. The six is Yeshua, the man. And the eight, in Yeshua, what is the number eight? New beginning. It's a new beginning, right? And so, so, what was the three? The three represents the triunity of the Godhead, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Eight is the beginning, the, 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 beginning, the six is man, because six was, man was created on the sixth day. So it's kind of like between God and man, a new beginning? God gives man a new beginning, right? And what happens here is, uh, who wants to read 2 Corinthians chapter 5? I keep going back to rights of purification in uh, Exodus. I don't that makes sense in the difference between righteousness and man trying to make a logical deductive argument where we have to do an inductive argument pulling out of God's word. What verse 5? 17. 5 through 17? Or 5 through 17. 17. Verse 17. 17. Yes. Excuse me, I'll see what Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone, bye bye, and the new has come in forever. Okay, so the old is gone. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry, I added a word. I'm sorry. And the new has come in forever, right? <laughs> Teaching righteousness. So the old man, the old man is. Bye bye. <coughs> okay, Being kicked to the curb, read, buddy. Who wants to read Ephesians chapter 4, verse 24? Old man is a sinful nature. Well, that sinful nature is supposed to go bye bye because it says when we accept Yeshua, we have the mind of Yeshua. Right? Yeshua right. Yeah. And if we have the mind of Yeshua, there's not supposed to be anything in there except Ephesians. Unless what? you have your will or <laughs> But it, there's got to be a way to express that, like having a, a filter on your mind or your filter ears. Filter on your mind, Ephesians 4, 24. Keep all the evil out. Yeah. I'll do it. You got it done? I'll okay, go ahead. Page page page. Page. John, it says that you put on a new man which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. 
Okay, so you put on the new man created in righteousness. 425, is that what you said? 424. Yeah. That holiness. You got it, Ben? I got it. She just read it. She yeah. read it. Okay, read it again, Ben. Maybe you got a different version. <laughs> K N K J V. And that you put on the new man which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. Mm -hmm. Okay. There's the word righteousness. What's what's baptism supposed to represent? New creation. New creation. New creation. Okay. What happens? The old man goes down in the water. Death. Never to be seen again. And there is right to the stay new life. Right? The new man is right. supposed to come, right? He dies himself. Old man dies. According to old man old dies. Man. Along with those bad spirits. Bad spirits. Several. We've got to confess the Word of God over our life. That's what it comes yeah. down to. So there's uh, several yeah, yeah. different yeah. sections yeah. in Gematria. Now we can take this 386 and we can reduce it down and you get 17. <laughs> and we go back and get 8 and we're back to well, the well, That's it. <laughs> but I mean, God is good, right? Okay. All the time. The one. This, this is from Yeshua's name now. We go down to 17. The one is God, and the seven is completion. So, so what does that show us? Yeshua, you need God. in Yeshua, God completed everything. You need right? God, but he hasn't completed everything. We don't well, understand, go back to rule number one. He has. He has. That's right. Remember, this is one more. He's outside the time frame. As far as God is concerned, he's completed everything. Go back to Genesis chapter Because he knows, he knows the end from the beginning. He knows where everything's going to end up at. He knows where every person's going to end up. It's all done. It's, it's all done already. We're, we're, still, we're still living it out. We're still living it out, walking around on this planet here. But he already knows the end from the beginning. He, he already knows everything that's going to happen in our future. He's outside time and space. But the first word, Bereshit, he gets those talks about the cross and the yep. beginning. He's, he's outside. And one of the interesting things about this one and seven is now we go back the other way from the gematria back to the alphabet. Uh -oh. So now you have the letter all left. The letter Aleph is what? The first, the first, the preeminent one. So who's Yeshua? First. The first and the last. Aleph and Aleph the, the, the last. Aleph He's the Aleph in the top. Right. Now the letter, the number seven is the letter Zion, and the letter Zion, the pictogram of it is a matic. and a matic is a form implement that's used for harvesting. So the one that's first, what's he going to come and do? Harvest. Harvest in the end. He's going to harvest. And one of the other representations of the matic is a sword. So he comes, so he's coming to, actually he's coming with the sword, isn't he? Of Revelation, he uses that. And, the word is now. and what is he going to do? The sword is what? He has a two-edged sword in his mouth. King yeah. Kings, Lord of Lords. He leads what? The armies of heaven. He's Adonai Savaot. That's us coming back with him. Lord of Hosts. And we come back with him. Yes. We come back with him. That's right. But when he sense. comes with that sword, he's going to take a harvest. And what's he going to do? Separate. He's going to separate, separate the wheat, wheat the from tares. the tares. And what happens to all the tares? They get fluffed up and burned up. <laughs> and what happens to the wheat? They get caught in the wind and the wind blows it away. The wheat and goes into his barn, barn, right? Wheat goes in the barn, chaff goes in the wind. Chaff goes in the barn. That's a good reference for that. It says, all the nations will be gathered before him. 
Yeah. And he will separate them from one another as a shepherd divides his sheep and the goats. What scripture was that? Um, Matthew 25, right. 31. Yeah, when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the right. holy angels with him, then he'll sit on his throne, the throne of his glory. Matthew what? 25, 25, 31. 31. 31. Yeah. 31. So the yeah. select, that ties in, <laughs> and there's probably hundreds of scriptures you can, yeah. can relate to this. Now, I took the 386, and you can go back and do the pictograms of the 386, which is uh, the third letter is Gimel, the eighth letter is the letter Ket, and the um, six is the Vav, which is the Peg. And so the Gimel is gather or harvest, the uh, Ket is a wall or to separate, and the vav is the man or the peg. Now, <clears throat> the scripture tells us that everything is put together by Yeshua. Okay, what's he building? He's building the spiritual temple, right? So he's, he's going to Okay, a peg is a way of connecting things, holding things together, holding things down, connecting things. Oh, so he's things. putting together what? He's putting together a spiritual house, and it's all put together by what? His word, His right? Word, right? His word. And there's going to be a wall, and that wall is going to separate between what's just and holy and righteous and what's evil and unrighteous and unholy. There's going to be a wall between them. They'll be outside the camp. Huh? They'll be outside the camp. Okay, that ties into our Torah portion this week. Okay, where Rabbi talked about Metzora, he talks about the leper. And actually, when you go through that Torah portion, there's different forms of leprosy. And what they're actually talking about is a spiritual leprosy and a physical leprosy. The spiritual leprosy okay, was a spiritual infection. Okay, Lashan Hora is one of the main words, that's evil speech, or gossip. Okay, you speak to one person, they speak to another person, it spreads all over the place just like a physical infection can. Okay, the other type of leprosy was a physical leprosy, which is an actual physical infection. I'm eating too much According, pig. according to Torah, okay, according to Torah, <laughs> Both of those forms of leprosy were put outside the camp. Right. The spiritual leprosy was outside the camp, so the, so the camp couldn't, couldn't be infected spiritually. The physical leprosy, the infection was put outside the camp, so the camp couldn't be infected physically. And the priest, by the descriptions they were given in the Torah, when the person came to them, they could look at that person and they would know whether it was a physical leprosy or it was a spiritual leprosy and they could discern what the person's problem was and deal with whatever spiritual problem or physical problem the person had. Okay? Wow. Huh? I said, wow. That's heavy, yeah. though. I mean, when you stop and think about it. I just heard that some of the people that are studying cancer, of course, they have all different things, but um, a naturopathic doctor said that they've just come out. Some doctors say that all cancer is a combination of the leprosy bacteria combined with three viruses. So there are some people that are saying all cancer has some of the leprosy bacteria mm -hmm. in it. Well, that I, that I don't know. That's just interesting. Because I just that is interesting. But we do know that there are a lot of physical ailments that are caused by uh, stress and different things that people do. And basically what it does, 
is any outside pressures and stress and different things like that, they compromise your immune system and make you susceptible. Can, can I throw a, a, a wrench in that, in that little yeah. scenario? Yeah. Okay. The bone and marrow, you know, when you get into the, the, the medicalness of it and the theology behind the sword, the double-edged sword cutting down to the bone and marrow, when the bone and marrow gets confused, or there's too much of this strife and all this stuff, okay. that causes the marrow not to overcome the sickness and produce what's needed to heal the body, because God in His infinite wisdom, let us never forget that, that He had already set that so that it would contain and take care of those problems. It's like some of the problems we have with... Uh, 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 cancer or whatever, and it builds a wall around it and mm -hmm. contains it till they take out that cyst or whatever it is. But that's because of the way God made our body. It wasn't because BAM! The evolution thing was making it happen because of confusion. Illuminati says that. That's what they're doing with us now. But anyway, so that bone and marrow thing, that's a, a good probable cause is to, to the confusion that allows some of that to happen because then it can't produce antibiotic or the the, the ingredient that's needed to fix, you know, the problem. So when you're body. saying the word of God cuts to the bone and marrow, you're saying it cuts out the, the spiritual confusion. Right. Okay. That, that's another thing with the has because His word will cut all wickedness out from oh, among right. us or from the world when He comes back, because He's going to deal with it then. Yeah. And what happens <clears> now <throat> is we'll finish up this whole thing. We'll wrap it all up in uh, Revelation chapter 21. Yeah, Four thousand kids have died in March last year. 21? In Revelation 21, the new, heavens, new earth. the new heavens and the new earth, the new Jerusalem. That's where we're all headed, hopefully, right? To the hopefully. new Jerusalem. And in the new Jerusalem, it says, And one of the seven angels, who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues, came and spoke with me, saying, Come here, I shall show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. He carried me away in the spirit to a great high mountain and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, having the glory of God. The brilliance was like a very costly stone as a stone of crystal clear jasper. It had a great high wall with 12 gates, and at the gates, 12 angels. And names were written on them, the, those of the 12 tribes of the sons of Israel. And it had the gates going north, south, east, and west, three on each side. The city had 12 foundations with the names of the 12 apostles. And they measured the city. And when you come down, it says in verse 22, And I saw no temple in it, for the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb are its temple. The city had no need of the sun or the moon to shine upon it, for the glory of God illumined it. And its lamp is the Lamb, Yeshua is the light. And the nations shall walk by its light, and the kings of the earth shall bring their glory to it. There shall be no night there, and its gates shall never be closed. They shall bring the glory and the honor of the nations to it. And nothing unclean, and no one who practices abomination or lying, shall ever come into it, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Okay. Pastor Gene, we'll close this in prayer. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the insights that Kenny has, uh, Lord, and may we take these things to heart. And Lord, we, we do thank you that you are faithful to Forgive us of our sins when we confess them, Lord. And Lord, we thank you for what you've done for us, the man, your son, who came and paid the price for us all. We thank you, Father. And I pray, Lord, that each of us in here would give our bodies back as a living sacrifice unto you, holy, acceptable unto you, Lord. And not be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of our minds, that we may know what your good and acceptable, perfect will is. Guide us through this week, Lord. May we uh, may we be a blessing to somebody this week, Lord, and speak good word, Lord, in your name, in Yeshua's name. It's in his name I pray. Amen. 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 Amen.